Good morning and welcome to a special edition of KPRC 2 Plus Now. I'm Zach Lajway. Today we're doing things a little differently and that's because the third trial of a young man accused of killing his parents almost seven years ago starts today. Yes, we are talking about the A.J. Armstrong trial. The Armstrongs very well known in this community. The father, a former NFL player, the mother, the love of his life. And despite these murders almost seven years ago, the Armstrong family is standing by AJ. So looking ahead on how we plan to cover this trial, we ran into one hurdle, and that is no cameras were allowed in the news in the courtroom. So we had to think outside the box. How are we going to show you the evidence, the emotion? So starting today, we are decoding the legalese. We are breaking down the arguments and we're priming you to be the judge. This is the bench. Welcome to the initial inaugural edition of The Bench. Let's get right into it. Leticia Quinones. Good morning. Is a defense attorney to the stars. You work <laughs> a lot with Rusty Harden. I do. Deshaun Watson was just one of your clients. He was. You understand the inner workings of what's going on in a courtroom. Of course. Right next to you is Rilwan Belugan, one of our greatest reporters, who also has an understanding of things that are happening in a courtroom. I try to. And we've got fireworks right off the bat, guys. What happened last yeah. week? Yeah, so last week the defense purportedly got some information that suggested that one of the jurors had a relationship, a romantic relationship with one of the prosecuting attorneys. Which is a huge, like, bombshell allegation. Absolutely, absolutely. And I think that the prosecution was upset because they felt that the defense kind of alluded to the fact that it could have potentially been one of the prosecuting attorneys right. on the trial It team. was unclear. Yeah, it Wording was unclear. unclear. Yeah, yeah. And it turned out not to be the case. So I think that upset the state, and they then filed motions on Friday suggesting that this case should be put off to give time for this stuff to go away. The bottom line is both sides at this point want to delay the beginning of this trial, correct? That's what it appears to at this point. When you saw that, um, the motion itself, what was yeah. your reaction to it? Whoa. Yeah. Like, my initial reaction was like, this could be a problem. Mm. You know, because the state wants to make a big deal that it wasn't the actual or the person wasn't part of the trial team, that's nonetheless, it's still on their team. Mm -hmm. And there's someone who's potentially dating a juror. You don't know what kind of information can go back and forth. So when I saw that, and what really stuck to me was that the prosecution knew that back then during the second trial and didn't share that information. Exactly, that was my question. Yeah. I mean, did they have a duty to disclose that? So technically, no, per se. There's no duty in the rules that say that because that juror having that relationship is not a reason to strike them, right? Mm -hmm. At the end of the day, the juror has to say that I can be fair and impartial, irregardless of anything else. So no, there is no duty, but in professionalism, keep things clean? Is that something that they should have done? Absolutely. So was it right of Rick DeToto, here's one quick question, and his defense team to sort of hold this information to right before the trial gets going? He's claiming that he had just learned of the mm -hmm. information, but there are sort of pieces to this that make us question that. Yeah, so what I saw was that the defense, Rick DeToto, stated that he actually got the information on the 26th, mm -hmm. right? Which was Wednesday of last week. Correct. Filed his motion on that Thursday. The state says that's who he, by the way. Yeah. I think he had the info months ago. I saw that. Well, and then the state files the response to that motion saying, no, these guys knew about that since January. So, I mean, that's still up in the air as to when they actually got the information. And we should note that in the state's motion filing itself, they're saying this juror was never seated. This is yeah. an alternate juror. So, and they're also claiming that this person did not have a relationship with anyone on the def on the state's pro on the prosecutors. Someone within the DA's office is what the state is saying about this. Is that well, an important delineation? If they're not on the team, it's okay, but everyone's on the same team over yeah. there. I call it hogwash, right? Because mm. number one, 
even though that juror is an alternate juror, they're eating lunch with the jurors that are deliberating. I mean, these are their new fast friends, yeah. right? So but not deliberating know. with them, correct? They're not deliberating, but they're spending, you know, quality time with these folks and relationships are built with people who are on jurors. So you don't know if they're talking after, you know, mm. or what, how much influence that alternate juror can have on those who are actually deliberating. And the state's motion claim has this alleged blatant fa falsehoods were contained within the motion that counsel himself has debunked, albeit not until after he created a media storm influencing the rampant community conversation. So all of that, do you think this does play a role at all in today, what's happening in there later this morning on jury selection? I think what's gonna happen is, number one, the judge is not going to be happy at the tactics that both sides are playing. Hmm. Um, I think the judge is going to want, look guys, be fair. If you get some information, share it. And then if you have something of the sort with such a high profile case, don't just arbitrarily file things, but at the same time, Rick DeToto, he has an obligation to his client without considering what the state might think or if their feelings are going to What's be hurt. What's the goal here, though? I mean, it, 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 it's, I mean, to, could the judge at this point, the judge has to sort all this out, and do they do that before we even get into jury selection now? Absolutely, absolutely. I don't think that there's no way, given the late filings on Friday, that she does not address this issue before selection begins. Right off the bat? Right that, off the bat. Does that happen in open court? So, yeah. So, okay. Mm. Absolutely. It should, right? It's a public trial. Yeah. Absolutely. And then what are her options at that point, in, in a loose sense? I mean, they, the state has asked for sanctions against the defense. I think that's a bit egregious. Um, I think they're drawing some really fine lines. Rick never really specifically made the allegations that the state is saying he made. Didn't name anybody he didn't specifically. Name anyone. He never said that this person, well, there, let me say this. He did say that there was deliberating going on, but in the same token, he also said that it was an alternate juror, but the state did not know that when they learned of the information during the second trial. So because they did not know if this was going to be a seated juror or alternate juror, what Rick is saying is, hey guys, you should have told us that immediately. I mean, common sense would think that you would share that, although it could derail things at that point. If Absolutely. You, yeah. Absolutely. But is that even something you ask uh, for possible jurors? Are you in a relationship? <laughs> it, it's that's. I don't think that's a normal question you would think to ask. It's not normal, but I bet you it would be normal now. <laughs> It's not normal, but I think that this is a learned lesson for a lot of us. You know, I tell you what, it's going to be something I ask from going mm. going forward, for sure. And then let's talk about that, because what was supposed to happen today was jury selection, which wasn't going to be like plain old jury selection. The panel works differently, as I understand it from the court coordinator. They're going to bring in a panel of 64 people yeah. at some point. And then the very first sort of... Um, operations will be like any other jury that they'll have general questions they thought they would cut down the field to like half and have 32 with general questions then pull those 32 or so people into individual sort of breakout rooms and talk to them have you ever seen something like that oh yeah it happens all the time but primarily with death, death penalty, penalty cases, cases. Mm. not a case where death penalty is not on the why table. why do we go through this different procedure for these big cases why here well, because of the Sixth Amendment, Joel, that says you have a right to a fair trial. So time should never be the reason why we circumvent due process, right? And so why do we do it to ensure that the defendant and the state is getting a fair trial? And sometimes the only way you can do that is sitting down in front of that juror, mano y mano, having a conversation about potential biases or things that they may have heard in the past that could influence their verdicts. What will that look like when they're having this breakout room, as Joel said? Is that the uh, both attorneys standing there just asking a string of questions to this smaller group, trying to get them to be more forthcoming? I think individual. It's one-on-one, -on -one, I yeah. think, they're going to yeah. talk to them. Yeah, one-on-one, one-on-one. -on -one. On -one. So you're going to have one juror seated in the chair. You're going to have the legal team for the defense as well as the prosecution and the judge. And they're going to just start firing off questions. That's a big confrontational it event. Is. It is, it is. And you can imagine, right, this layperson, ordinary citizen, sitting with all these lawyers in front of them asking all these questions. You can't help but think that they're going to be a little intimidated and in how you know, that's going to skew the process, if at all. And you know, they're allotting a full, I think it's a full month, essentially, for yeah. this. Uh, why, 
why? I mean, I think they, the last uh, trial, they, they picked a jury in two or three days, I believe. It was fairly quickly. Why is there, are they allotting a month, and will it really take that long to get this job done? Potentially, yes, because of the individual board hire. You know, every juror could potentially take two to three hours. Mm -hmm. So you do that for 32 folks, and yeah, there that's you have it. That's going to take up yeah. some time. Can kind of explain to us how we got here. There's a reason that we are now interviewing all these prospective jurors one at a time instead of in a large group. This is because Judge Johnson, she was the one who asked or yeah. made the proposition of just moving the trial out of Harris County entirely. Now that's unprecedented. Now in my 25 years, now I have not seen that. Well, the judge, what we call sua sponte, which basically means on its own motion. The state hasn't filed anything. The defense hasn't filed anything. The court is just saying, you know what? I think the right thing to do here is to move this. So the court did it sua sponte. And oh, it caused a stink and an uproar, even in the defense bar. You know, they were calling in lawyers who had years of experience saying, this is a good place to have a trial. There's nothing to suggest other than the regular media coverage that any potential high profile case will get. Um, and it shouldn't be moved. And it certainly shouldn't be moved because the judge feels so mm. without the defendant saying, I feel my rights will be violated. You know, so that was a big deal. You but would think that Judge Kelly Johnson would be somewhat media friendly. I mean, in a previous life, she was on the White House advanced press team. She understands it. I talked to her court coordinator, who seems to be somewhat friendly to the idea of cameras and our presence mm -hmm. and it being a public proceeding. With that being said, when we go through this next month or so, as soon as we even get there to the jury selection process, we're not going to be a part of that. People don't get to see what's going on. Uh, minute by minute in that situation, as I understand it. And the Vordire process? Yes, right. Well, normally the only reason why we don't get to see that is because there's just not enough room in the courtroom. It does seem that way. That's they what happens. Up. Yeah, because let's say normally my clients, family want to be involved. Well, there's just nowhere for them to sit. And so during the Vordire process, the public is normally not there mm -hmm. because those seats are all filled with the 64 jury panel, 64 folks on the jury panel. So it's not because they shouldn't have access. It's just that logistics won't allow for it. I'll say I've been in one of these once. The judge allowed us to sit in the juror bank. Okay. And we just sat and watched. We weren't allowed to report anything, just watch what was going on. So this is different where we're not going to be in the room at all. So yeah. we don't know what these um, perspective, these attorneys are asking these jurors. Yes. Yeah. Does that play a role? Is this at I all for you as an attorney if you're in that room? Well, you know, doing for Dyer, it's not a big deal to me whether or not the public sees it. I'm more focused on getting a juror who's going to be fair and impartial. Whether or not the public gets to hear about it, I don't really care. Mm -hmm. Now, once the trial starts, yeah, I want the public to see because I want to make sure that the process is fair throughout the trial. But during the Dyer process, not so much. I think you asked me, Joe, what got all this started? Well, if you look back in the records, what you'll see is that the defense team went on a different, went on a, almost like a media tour, so to speak. They sure did. Yeah, and then they started sharing information that potentially should not have been shared. Right. Meaning, so if you get... Is that your view? That's certainly the state's view. And, 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 and they're going to have a hearing, I think, uh, for De, De Toto's conduct yeah. during that press tour after this trial concludes is what I understand. That's what I heard. That's what I heard. Because you can't share information that you receive as a result of the state sharing discovery with you, the evidence in the case. So you can't share that information until after the trial is over because that evidence could be inadmissible. So now you have inadmissible evidence potentially in the earshot of a potential juror. So that becomes a problem. Yeah. Yeah, and that's what started it all. So what are the options? I just want to hit this one more time so I understand. I mean, what do we think that Judge Kelly Johnson's going to do here um, in terms of this latest issue from last week of the back and forth of uh, everything we've seen? I mean, with the motions flying, what are the options here? I mean, is she going to make a decision that, hey, we're going to press forward and we're going to do it right now? Does she give him another week? Did we change venues? I mean, what, what's she going to do? When I saw that, I, I got the trial lawyer's anxiety, right, as a defense attorney, as, oh my God, did I do something wrong that could potentially end up with the result that I was fighting against all along, and that is a change of venue. Because she could say that. She could say, look, guys, 
I gave you the opportunity to do the right thing, and now you're filing documents that could potentially leak false information. So that could be the remedy. What I don't think will happen is a continuance. Mm. I think that either she's going to say, you know what, we're going to change the venue, which I don't think that will happen. I think that'll be too far outlandish. Or she's going to say, let's go. This is not going to stop really? anything. That's my thought. She did make a really snap decision, or not snap. I'm sure she thought about it. But when um, the defense uh, filed that motion last Thursday, she was like within an hour she had given the response to that, yeah. sort of uh, putting that to bed. And I don't think much changed, except for now it's the state asking for it, but for the same reasons. So if she didn't feel that the information rose to a level to affect a potential juror, uh, panel for the defense. I don't think she'll do it for the state either. In, unless the state wants to delay the trial, I don't under, understand the reasoning behind their motion on Friday. I mean, they just want to get it on the record that what was said in the previous motion was inaccurate. It's yeah, well, what they're saying is we need time for this stuff to die down. Uh, right now, yeah. it's fresh in the minds of these potential jurors. Number one, we want them to get the accurate information. Mm -hmm. And then two, we need time for this to die down before we start picking a jury, you know, in this case. But you don't think the judge is buying that? that I don't think so. She didn't buy it for the defense, so why would she buy it for the state? We're it's the same information. So today we're doing jury selection. Yeah. What's an ideal juror for you? So I think in this particular case, you definitely want grandparents, right? Mm. Because grandparents love their grandchildren. So we're going to bring out a board here, so in case you want to write some of the things that you look okay. for in an ideal This is high tech. Per yeah, ideal juror. That. Well, believe it or not, I prefer it this way. I came up in the world where there weren't PowerPoints. We used to just <laughs> stand in front of the jury and have a conversation. I think we want grandparents, guys, because grandparents have sympathy for their grandchildren and in this particular case we know that the grandparents are sticking by this young man clearly clearly so we want that we also want because we've heard evidence throughout the trial in regards to their business and things that may not have been going well so we want sticklers we want responsible people because if you're not responsible in business then and you see that potentially that they were not responsible and could cause problems with money, then maybe there's this person out there that they owe money to. They're not going to understand or have as much empathy for individuals who don't handle their business or pay taxes. Or, and I'm not saying they didn't. I'm just saying those type of things. So we want a responsible person, I think, on this jury. And then also we want someone who is not high tech. Well, why do you say that, Letitia? Well, for one, remember this whole thing cringes upon this alarm system. Right. Yeah. Right? Remember? It's, I think, to me, that seems like pretty damning evidence. I thought so, too. But remember the defense we saw brought in someone they spent $50,000 on mm. to say this alarm system doesn't always work the way that they say it worked. And that Did that wash? Does that wash? Apparently it did. Yeah, Think I guess about it, it did. Joel. I guess it did. <laughs> Eight to four to not guilty <laughs> last time. So apparently it's washing. So you want someone who really doesn't understand that and will listen to the defense expert and say, okay, I can buy into it because I don't know any better. Yeah. And on so, that on that note, the the state has argued that the the alarm system was on, so it must have meant someone within the house is the one who committed this crime. And the defense has been saying, well, this stuff is tricky. Yeah. It's not foolproof. And they said something about the garage door alarm is what the defense was saying, that HPD didn't look into that part. They didn't look at that garage alarm yeah. to, for this whole thing. So that high tech is interesting that you put that on there. But how are you getting over the entire hurdle of no forced entry? Mm. I mean, that's a big <laughs> hill to climb. And, you know, when I heard that evidence initially, I was like, that's the nail in the coffin for the defense, right? Yeah. But two hung juries who heard the same information. And what I thought was ironic, in the first jury, it was four for not guilty, right. eight for guilty. Right. Yeah. And then in the second trial, swap. Swap. an exact swap, mm -hmm. you know, so. So is I, that a trend? Is that just ra random happenstance? I mean, the defense is, I'm sure, each bite at this apple you're honing your skills. You're seeing where your weaknesses are, what you have to shore up. Both sides should Both be sides. doing that. Yeah. Both sides should be doing that, but apparently it worked better for the defense the second time. So it's going to be interesting to see if they're able to get 12 people to a unanimous decision. I know it's a, it's a delicate 
subject to talk about, but I, I'm just curious about it. Does are you looking for certain makeups in terms of uh, gender? Are you looking for certain makeups in terms of nationalities or in terms of you race? Can say it. I say I'm not scared say to say it. it. I mean, are you? Are you looking for black people? Well, are you listen, looking for white people? Say it. Does say it matter? It. Listen, I don't play in the world of fairy tale. I've been known that, to be the truth about me. Do I want a black juror on this case? Absolutely, I do. Absolutely, you do. Absolutely, if I do. If you are the defense. If I'm the defense. Yeah. That's exactly what I want because they are going to have empathy and sympathy for this young black male, and they're going to require the state to prove this case beyond a reasonable doubt before they would want to convict another young black male. And that's what it should be, right? So you want a black juror because a black juror is going to understand the importance of making the system work, holding the state to its burden, and remembering we have a constitution. And that constitution says beyond a reasonable doubt, you must believe that this young man killed his parents. That's the standard. That's the standard. And I always say this at the end. If you have a doubt, and that doubt is reasonable, that's a not guilty verdict all day. Mm -hmm. And I think it just culturally, it just goes better. You know, if that's someone who understands my culture, a juror of my peer, right? Mm -hmm. You want a jury of your peers. What about male, female? Does that make a difference? To you? In say, this particular say. case, I don't think so. No? No, not to me. Mm -hmm. Not to me. You know, um, unless she's a grandmother. Mm. That's yeah. really the key for That's you. That's the key for me. Let's get grandmas That's in the key. there. Let's okay. get grandmas in there. Yeah. Because grandmother's going to get on the stand. And that grandmother is going to identify with that grandmother. And that grandmother is going to vouch for her grandson. Remember, this is her child. Right? Yeah. So her child is dead. So if she's going to get on the stand and say, my grandbaby did not do this, and this is my child that's deceased, that's powerful. Yes, it is. Mm -hmm. That's I would powerful. Think so too. Yeah. Yeah. And do you think that's why uh, DeToto's had the grandparents in nearly every single, every single day of each, both trials? Well, I think that's one of the reasons. And then I think the other reason is that they want to be there. You know, this is their grandson. Mm -hmm. And so they have stood bes beside him, behind him, and for him, and they're going to continue to do so. And so that just works well for the defense. Can we talk for a second about the, the whole, not bizarreness, but uniqueness of this being the third yeah. trial? Have you ever seen that before? No. no. no? Especially if, after the second trial, there was an eight to four count for not guilty. So you're surprised they even went for this again? Oh, yeah, because normally when you get a case and it's 8 to 4 for not guilty or 10 to 2 for not guilty, a lot of times the state will just dismiss it, dismiss the charge. So the fact that they're gearing up to pay the cost and expense to go third time is unprecedented. What do you think is behind that? Is it really, is it truly, I mean, are there different motivations? Is it truly a search uh, to bring justice in this whole thing? I mean, Right in the middle, I mean, was it last week or the week before District Attorney Og announced mm -hmm. that she's uh, running again? Mm -hmm. I would imagine she, it would be greatly helpful to her if she wins one of these before the election comes around. It would be great for her to win a high profile case at this point. Really? <laughs> yeah, yeah. I mean, she tends to have a lot of high profile cases that they go after vigorously, but just haven't been really successful a lot of times. Mm -hmm. So um, she needs a win. She, needs, she to needs to win. But I do think they're seeking justice, too. I do believe that they believe this young man is the person who killed, you know, Don and Antonio Sr. And so I think they're moving forward because that's just truly what they believe in. I would be surprised to see if it hangs again if they go to a fourth one. No. No, could I don't they? think so. They could. They could. Can you, can you do it in perpetuity? Just keep trying it? Yeah. Really? Yeah, but I think that they're going to have an issue with that. I think that at that point, the citizens of Harris County are going to be like, well, wait a minute. You know, sometimes the system is what it is. Mm -hmm. You know, we have a system. It's in place. If you can't find him guilty beyond a reasonable doubt, then guess what? He's not guilty. It's, it's so, I mean, what is it, six or seven years since the crime happened? Mm, 2016. 2016, right? Mm -hmm. And A.J. Armstrong at the time is, what, 16? Mm -hmm. 16. He's 23 now. He's a father himself. Mm -hmm. And I hear married. Is yeah. he married? I hear that's that. Yeah. Is he married? Yeah. Okay, so, I mean, that's a whole different dynamic there. 
and I don't want to break things, everything down in these terms, but I would think that he is a father now and a married and sort of a, a stable lifestyle um, uh, sort of helps his case. It does. In a jury's eyes, doesn't it? Does. it? Absolutely. Marriage brings about stability, right? When you hear someone is married, that's someone who's willing to make a commitment, a commitment to someone and to something. And so for a young man of that age to be married and stable and a father and being a productive citizen, you can't help but notice that the same way you would notice it if he was going down the wrong track. If he was a drug addict or something of that sort or a thief or a He did have a, a couple bond, bond condition violations along the way that kind of looked the other way. One of them was, was for marijuana. marijuana. But Are we really going to call someone a drug addict for smoking weed? These I'm days, certainly not. I'm, I'm just, I'm just, I'm just a guy who points out the little, the little side item. Yeah, I think that that's with something being legal, and now our federal government is not even prosecuting marijuana cases. So, I mean, I don't it, think it, it was a bond violation. It's a violation. Yeah, yeah. yeah. it's not a new case. It's a bond violation. Okay. So um, I've got the producer whispering in my ear. Thank you. <laughs> yeah, one, what, we want to hit at one or two more subjects, and that is the. So alternate jurors, that is mm. completely at the judge's discretion in terms of how many alternate jurors you want to field? Yes. What are we looking at? Two, five, four? What in a think? case like this, I would expect four. Really? Mm -hmm. Yeah, at least. Yeah. And it's so important and it's so costly. This is the third trial. Three times the taxpayers have had to pay for this. So if one of the jurors gets sick or an emergency or something like that happens, you don't want to run out of alternate jurors to the point where you're going to have to start this process all over again. Are the alternates sitting in the box, too? They're sitting near the box, so they have chairs on the side of the box okay. that they sit the alternates in. And sometimes you have gentlemen on the jury who, even though they're on the pettit jury, mm -hmm. which is the jury that actually hears and deliberates, uh, they will allow the ladies to mm -hmm. sit in a more comfortable seat. So just because you see jurors sitting in those chairs doesn't necessarily mean they're the exact mm -hmm. alternate. That's the insider expertise that we have. <laughs> Absolutely. Wouldn't have known that without you here. There you go. Talk to us a, to a little bit also that kind of reference it in the beginning. These alternate are not supposed to deliberate with them, with no. the other jurors? No. Why is that? Well, because you don't want it to be tainted by someone who doesn't have a vote. Mm. So if you allow the alternate jurors in and they start giving their perspectives and people start buying into their perspectives, but they don't have a vote. So you can't let that happen. So once deliberation starts, some judges will allow folks to go home. And then some ju judges will say, you can go sit in a room, bring your laptop, bring you something to read, because if something happens during deliberation, now remember the first time they deliberated in this case, 19 hours? Yeah. yeah. The second time, 18 hours? So that's a long deliberation. Anything could happen. So if something happens, we want to be able just to go to the witness room and grab a juror as opposed to tracking down and searching for someone who may have taken a two-week vacation once you release me. Do you expect there to be anything interesting or different in terms of sequestering, or they just get, I mean, because this is going to be all over the news. Yeah. We're jumping on it, obviously, and I'm yeah. sure others across I mean, the city. It's a sexy will. case. It is a, you know what it reminds me of? The Menendez brothers. Uh-huh, yeah. kind of. Right? Yeah, yeah it's, it's the Houston's version of the Menendez brothers, except a solo actor here. And so, yeah, I, I expect there to be sequestration once the deliberation starts. So what do you? I know we're jumping the gun a little bit, but some of the things that are in my head and some of the things that are interest me are sort of the sideward point toward another brother. Yeah. yeah. Where is yeah. that going to go this time around? Do we have any idea, or is that is that solid ground? Is that getting us drawing our attention somewhere else? How do you see that? Well, interestingly enough, what I found was that there was a juror who reported that no one believed that the brother did it that out of the 12, no one really believed that, that it was just a red herring the mm -hmm. defense put in there. Yeah. So based on that, you know, I'm not in the deliberation room, but just based on what that juror says, I don't think that goes very far, but. And this what is are you leaning on at that point? What are you leaning on at that point? I mean, to me, I'm, I, I, honestly, I'm, I'm, I'm just saying, this is just how I'm seeing it. I'm looking yeah. at this thing, studying this thing for this big old show we're doing, but when I look at this, I'm like, it's so hard to get around to me that there's, there's no sign that anybody else came in the home. Right. Who does that leave? Well, but look, on the other side, there's evidence that's just as 
influencing, i.e. no DNA right. mm -hmm. on the gun, right. Right? Mm -hmm. no right. fingerprints mm -hmm. on the gun, mm -hmm. no GSR, mm -hmm. which is the gunshot residue that happens once you fire a weapon. They're very small particles yeah. that emit into the air, mm -hmm. right? And they call it GSR. He had no GSR on his clothing or hands, he, no DNA of his on the murder weapon or the note, right? No fingerprints on any of that stuff, no blood. So that's kind of quirky too, isn't it? It sure is. It yeah, sure so is. it's like, okay, what do you do when you have this evidence and it makes you think, uh, I have a doubt. Doubt seems reasonable. We've got a lot Not of guilty. questions. A lot that's of, all they yeah. need. All right, they're giving us the, the, the big rodeo sign <laughs> that we've got to wrap up for, for just a second. But I think this has been a good inaugural edition of the bench. I love it. We're getting love going. And a lot is thank going down today. Thank you for having today. me. Yeah. Thank you. Thank yeah. you, Leticia. Rowan, thank you so much. And we're not done with our coverage because uh, at noon today, we're going to be on the TV side. At 6 o'clock, the TV side. And then we'll be threading ourselves in and out of 2 plus, I think, throughout the day. So thanks for joining us for this initial edition of the bench. And we'll be right back in your faces soon.